Welcome back to Game Theory 101. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topic is Tulloch Contests. Let's get to it. Thus far, we have only investigated standard sources of economic competition. Under Cournot competition, for example, the firms competed on the quantity of goods that they produced. This was the same in Stackelberg competition, although there the firm production decisions were made sequentially rather than simultaneously. Under Bertrand competition, the firms competed on price. Each of these is a fairly normal way that firms compete with one another when they're trying to sell goods. But those are not the only types of competitions that firms, or organizations more broadly, engage in. Starting with this lecture, we're going to pivot to those more exotic forms of competition. And this time, we're beginning with contest models, in which firms or organizations compete based off of effort or money spent. Contests in particular are important to study because they are ubiquitous. The origin of contest models lies in the advertisement literature. When you have two firms advertising, they are trying to convince consumers to buy their product and not their opponent's product. But the applications go well beyond that. Contests model effectively any sort of winner-take-all market, where companies need to exert effort to create the product as fast as they can and be the first one to bring it to market and thereby secure the entire market. We can also progress beyond traditional economic markets and study other forms of competition with contests. As we'll see in a moment, most raffles take the form of the type of contest model that we're specifically going to be studying in this lecture. Meanwhile, think about things like political campaigns, legal cases, sports, or even war. The more effort an organization spends, the more likely they are to win. The more you campaign in a particular state or region, the more likely you are to get more votes in that state or region. The more money you spend trying to gather evidence to go to trial, the more likely you are to win that case. The harder you practice, the more likely you are to win a game. The more money that you spend on your military and the larger army you mobilize, the more likely you are to win a war. Similar to a war, the more money that a contraband cartel spends to try to defend its turf, the more likely it is to secure that area. And finally, I've personally written an entire book on how rebel group support looks like a contest. If there are multiple rebel groups in a particular country, they will spend more and more effort to try to convince would-be supporters to join their organization and not a different organization. Hopefully I've now convinced you that contests are important. The next question is how best to study such competitions over effort exerted. As it turns out, almost all contest models share a few similarities. To begin, we're going to have at least two players engaging in this game. Simultaneously, they're going to select an effort level. So rather than in Cournot competition, the firms are choosing a level of production, here you're just choosing an effort. That effort level is going to be E sub I, where I is denoting the idea that this is group I's effort. And that amount is just something that is at least zero. Effort is not free, and so we're going to have a marginal cost of effort, M sub I, again, I denoting that this is group I's marginal cost, and that marginal cost is just some positive amount. And then we have the most important part of this the contest success function. This is simply a function that maps the vector of effort levels that each of the players has chosen to a probability of capturing the prize or a portion of the prize taken. In other words, if you tell me each of the effort levels that the players have chosen, the contest success function will then tell each of those players how much they expect to receive. And for the type of risk-neutral actor that we're going to be studying here, it is identical to think about whatever the function is going to spit out as the probability of winning the entire thing, or what portion that you're expecting to take on average. 
there are lots of different ways we could create that sort of contest success function. However, we definitely want to have two qualities of that function. First is that each player's expected portion of the prize should increase in its own effort. That is, the more effort you exert, the more money you put in, the more likely you are to win or the more likely you are to take more of the good. Similarly, each player's expected portion of the prize should decrease in all others' effort. So if you hold fixed your own effort level and you increase an opponent's effort level, then the amount of the good that you win should be going down. Despite the fact that there are a whole bunch of different ways you could structure a contest success function to meet those requirements, there is one in particular that receives a large amount of the focus, and that is something known as a Tulloch contest. In a Tulloch contest, and specifically the ratio form, a player's expected share is equal to his portion of the total effort exerted. In other words, if you are group I, then you take the effort that you have exerted and you divide it by the sum of all efforts. And that ratio, that proportion, is how much you're expecting to receive. Note that this is literally how a raffle works. If you buy one ticket, and 99 other people also each buy one ticket, then your probability of winning is 1 divided by 99 plus 1, or 1 in 100. And if you were to buy a second ticket, holding fixed everyone else, you would win 2 out of 101 times, and so forth. And then lastly here, the value of the prize is going to be common across everyone, and we're going to call that value v greater than 0. We're going to solve this in two ways. First, we're going to examine a symmetric n-player Tulloch contest. So in a symmetric game here, we're going to think about each of the players having identical marginal costs. Given that, player i's objective function is the value of the good v times the portion of the good it's expecting to receive, so we have the contest success function there, e sub i divided by the total amount of effort, minus its cost of engaging in this contest, which is the amount of effort it has exerted times its marginal cost. To calculate i's optimal effort level, we take the first order condition. That is, we take the derivative of the first line with respect to e i, because that is the thing that player i controls, and set it equal to zero. And if you do that, we get that expression on the second line. Ordinarily, what we would do next is solve for e sub i. However, because we are looking at a symmetric game, it stands to reason that we can look for a symmetric equilibrium. So rather than thinking about this as solving for i's optimal effort level, if each of the groups or each of the players is selecting the same amount of effort, then instead of having a bunch of different E subscript values, we can have a single E value. That is, we can look for a symmetric equilibrium where E1 is equal to E2, which is equal to E3, which is equal to all the way to En, which we're just going to simply call E. And if we make that substitution into the first order condition, well, this starts to simplify very nicely. And then we get our solution e is equal to the value v times n minus 1, the number of groups minus 1, divided by the marginal cost times the number of groups squared. This is the optimal effort level for each of these symmetric groups. There are a couple of comparative statics worth noting here. First, let's think about what happens to individual effort as we increase the number of groups. As it turns out, that effort is going to go down. In other words, if we're adding another group to the situation, then your amount of effort exerted will decrease. That's because you're expecting a larger overall share of effort to be spent with the additional group. And that means the marginal contribution of each unit of effort that you're spending is going to go down. And as a consequence, you are no longer as willing to spend as much as you were 
when there was one previous individual competing in the contest. The second comparative static is on the total amount of effort. And to calculate that, all we have to do is take the individual effort and multiply it by n, because we have n individuals all producing that amount. And if we do that, that gives us a total effort level of v times n minus 1 divided by m times n. This amount increases in n. So despite the fact that adding a group decreases individual effort, the aggregate amount of effort does increase. And furthermore, as the number of groups goes to infinity, the total amount of effort goes to v divided by m. This is notable because it is driving all of the value out of the contest. If v divided by m effort has been expended, then the expected utility for everyone added up together equals zero. You can see this in the figure on the bottom right. Here, I've set both v and m equal to 1. And you'll notice that as n is becoming very large, the total effort exerted is going closer and closer to 1. So the amount of profits that each of these groups is sharing is the difference between 1 and that total amount of effort. So when there are fewer groups around, there are actually decent profits to be had. But as n goes to infinity, all of those profits disappear. The second way I want to solve this is an asymmetric competition between two players. Here we have player 1's objective function as the value of the good v times the contest success function, which is e1 divided by e1 plus e2. And then you subtract out player 1's cost, which is that effort level times its marginal cost. Like before, to find player 1's optimal amount of effort, we take the first order condition of that top line. In other words, we take the derivative with respect to e1, because that's the thing that player 1 controls, and set it equal to 0. If we do that, and do a little bit of rearranging, we get v times e2 divided by the sum of e1 and e2 squared equal to m1. Of course, we can do the same thing for player 2 by just flip-flopping all of the 1s and 2s all along the way, and we get v times e1 divided by the sum of efforts squared equal to m2. Solving for the optimal efforts here requires a little bit more work because we're not going to just simply look for a situation where the amounts of efforts are identical. After all, the firms here are not identical. We have a unique marginal cost of m1 and m2. However, we still can do this. We have two equations with two unknowns, e1 and e2. That means we can solve for them. To make this a little bit easier to work with, we can divide off the marginal costs from the respective equations and then multiply both sides by the sum of the efforts squared. And if we do that, we go from line 1 to line 2. You'll notice that in both of the equations in line 2, we have an identical side. Specifically, both of the right-hand sides are equal to the sum of the efforts squared. That means we can set the two left-hand sides equal to one another, and having done that, we can now put one party's effort in terms of everything else. So here I've done that with player two. Player two's effort is equal to the marginal cost of player one times the effort level of player one divided by player two's marginal cost. To be clear, we're not done here. Player two's effort is now a function of player one's effort, and we still don't know that. But we can take this equation and use it to substitute into something else. Now that we have that value of e2, we can go back to one of the original equations, where we have just a single instance of e2, and substitute m1 e1 divided by m2 into that first equation. And if we do that, we'll have completely eliminated e2, and we'll have e1 
just in terms of M1 and M2 and V and nothing else. We get a little bit creative in how we manipulate that function, pulling out an E squared, dividing off an E1. We eventually can solve for E1. And when we do that, we get the mess there. But that mess is the equilibrium quantity of effort that player one will produce. At this point, solving for player two's effort is very easy because all we need to do is flip-flop the subscripts of one and two. And if we do that, then we can go through the exact same steps as we did before, and we get to player two's optimal level of effort, which is at the bottom line there. Let's conclude with a couple of noteworthy comparative statics. First, let's think about how player one's effort changes as a function of its own marginal cost. Intuitively, as its marginal cost increases, it becomes more expensive to exert effort, and intuitively you would expect player one's effort to go down. And indeed, that is what happens in equilibrium, as we see here. If you were to take the derivative of that top line with respect to M1, you would get a negative value, which is what the figure below is illustrating. As you increase M1, you are decreasing the amount of effort that player one is exerting in equilibrium. The more interesting comparative static is what happens with player one's effort as you increase player two's marginal cost. Here, the intuition is not obvious. On one hand, by increasing player two's marginal cost, you might think that player one is seeing player two as vulnerable and is willing to exert more effort to exploit that vulnerability. On the other hand, because player two's marginal cost is going up, perhaps its effort is going down, and perhaps then player one might want to decrease its effort by a little bit, although not much, to save on some of the costs of exerting effort itself. What we see here is that both of those intuitions can be correct. If we take the derivative of player one's equilibrium effort with respect to M2, we get the value times player one's marginal cost minus player two's marginal cost, all divided by the sum of the marginal costs cubed. As a result, if player one's marginal cost is larger than player two's marginal cost, that derivative is positive, and thus increasing two's marginal cost will result in an increase in player one's effort. On the other hand, if player two's marginal cost is larger than player one's marginal cost, then that derivative is negative, and increasing player two's marginal cost will result in a decrease in player one's effort. We can see this in the figure here. We're holding fixed player one's marginal cost at five, and we're then varying what's happening with player two's marginal cost and actually plotting player one's equilibrium effort. So you can see it's increasing up until we hit five, and once player two's marginal cost exceeds five, then player one's equilibrium effort starts to decline. So what's going on here? Well, imagine that your opponent has very, very low marginal costs. Then you know that you're going to be absolutely obliterated in the contest. And as a result, you don't exert much effort at all. But if we increase the opponent's marginal cost of effort, you're seeing an opportunity. They're not going to blast you as much as they had planned to before, and as a consequence, you're more willing to compete, and thus you exert more effort. In contrast, if your opponent already has very high marginal costs, they're not going to exert much effort into the contest. And if you further increase their marginal cost, that effort is going to further decline. In turn, you can pump the brakes a little bit because you know that your opponent isn't going to be fighting you very much and you can maintain a very high degree of winning without paying as much. So you slack off a little bit knowing that your opponent's marginal cost increasing is going to cause them to slack off as well. That wraps up this lecture. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope to see you next time. Take care.